بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أبا القاسم محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين لا سيما بقية الله روحي وأرواح العالمين لتراب مقدمه الفداء أما بعد respected scholars, elders, brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته In the previous night we started talking about the concept of salat the importance of prayers and we looked at particular sections of salat first and foremost we looked at the importance of Salat, which we viewed over some of the ahadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam, in which he states that the difference between the Mu'min or a Muslim and the Kafir is his Salat. Other narrations that we mentioned is Imam Sadiq Alaihi Afdur Salati Wasallam mentions that our intercession, and he's referring to Ahl al-Bayt's intercession, he says, our intercession will not reach those that take their prayers lightly. So therefore we looked at yesterday at the importance of Salat, the importance of such the pillar of Islam, of such a pillar in Islam. And then we moved on to talk about what Salat tries to teach us. And yesterday we looked at the idea of how Salat tries to humble us. And if we can quickly recap on it before starting tonight's topic, the recap was that if we looked at Iblis, when he prayed for 6,000 years in narrations, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one moment of arrogance brought him down after all that worship. Therefore, the question arises as to what kind of prayer was, Ibl was Iblis actually praying if he did not know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in essence. And tonight, inshallah, we'll talk about three particular faculties to continue from yesterday. As we started by talking about how Salat tries to teach us humbleness and remove the arrogance from one, oneself. So tonight, inshallah, I want to focus on how Salat, or what other things Salat tries to teach us, or tries to instill in us on a daily perspective that we may not look for, or actually ponder over. And inshallah, we'll move on to the concept of concentration. Because many people come forth and ask, Salah is very important, yes, but I find it very difficult to concentrate within Salah where you find many people come forth and think of everything except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whilst they're performing their salah. So we want to look at what would aid or what would help in the concept of the concentration in salat. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Salli ala Muhammad Muhammad. And inshallah on the final level we want to look at salatul layl. And the particular story about a young man that didn't pray but was aided by Imam Mahdi. And from that day on, he upholds his prayers. And how we can learn from this man and learn that our Imam looks at those people that take their prayers very seriously. Don't take their prayers in a light manner. So inshallah, to start off the topic for tonight and look at First and foremost, the attributes of Salah on a person's self, both physically and spiritually. Please help me in reciting aloud Salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. So we discussed yesterday one concept, which was the concept of arrogance. Where we said that the Arabians at the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam allowed themselves to take and comprehend every single pillar of Islam except the pillar of prayer where they found it very difficult to prostrate in a manner where their head is lower than that of their backside and how Allah tries to humble them by saying no you will submit to Allah's will you will have to bow down before the Almighty you have to humble yourself and remove that sense of arrogance that I am higher than anyone else now that's the first faculty. The second faculty I want to have a look at tonight is the aspect of time management. 
And it's very important, especially in a Western society. And I say this because we all understand the importance and why is it that we go to work from a specific time frame. As in, you can't go to work early and leave before work starts. There's a time frame in which you have to go towards work. You'll be prosecuted or will give, be given warnings if you go towards work late or if you leave early, isn't it? Therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tries to teach us that there's a specific time frame for everything in the first faculty. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that this, in the Quran, He says there's three particular stages in which you must pray. And those prayers, they have a time frame. And there's a time frame in which you can gain the best rewards, the highest rewards, and anything after that. And then there's a specific idea which is qadha. Once you overlap that, there's another set of rules and regulations in which, in which you perform salah. But to give us the concept and to grasp the idea that there is a time restraint, there is a small circle in which you can pray in, that ibadah is in. And that's not just with salah, that's for every single ibadah. Siyam, there's a time frame from when the sun rises till the sun sets, isn't it? Everything is within a particular time frame. There's particular salat. When the moon eclipses, there's particular time frames for everything. Laylatul Qadr. This is actually quite amazing. There's a narration as a side note. <laughs> there's a narration that says when it's raining, the doors of heaven are actually open. And whatever dua you actually make is accepted by Allah. So on that note, Let's raise our voices in a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. It's actually quite beautiful. So that's the first idea. There's a time restraint. There's a time gap. There's a time lapse for everything. And salah is one of them. Now, how can we apply this to our own lives? How can we apply the concept of time management to our own lives? Well, you see, nowadays, if we want to have in, a, in an aspect of concentration with Salat, if we take it into the next level of a job description, if we want to go towards a job, we're applying for a job, we're looking for jobs, what do we do? We first make a resume. When we make a resume, we look at the resume. We say, this is what we've achieved. This is what we're lacking for that job. This is what I have to achieve. This is what I have to look into, isn't it? Before you even apply for the job, in the same faculty, Salah tries to teach us this. Before you approach Salat, there's specific things that you have to do. There's specific aspects in which you have to prepare yourself, both physically in Tahara and spiritually in a mental state. Two aspects. In wudu, it tries to cleanse us both physically and mentally. Because you're preparing yourself mentally for salat. You're preparing yourself that I am going to meet my Lord, my Creator. I have to be on my best manners, in the best state of cleanliness. That's one aspect. Physically, you're purifying yourself. Take that aspect of going towards a job. If you want to pick a small metaphor tonight. The second level is when you go towards Salat. Nowadays we just put the turba down and Allahu Akbar. But there's a particular concept of concentration I need to look at tonight. When you go towards Salat, when you go towards a job and when you go towards Salat, when you go towards a job, it's a job interview. You go and you go and Google, you have to see in Google that job, what kind of questions the interviewee might ask you. Then you go and look at clothes. You make sure you're groomed. You make sure you wear the best clothes. You make sure that you're presentable. You go and Google whether you should put too much cologne, not enough cologne. What should I smell like? How should I look at him? How is my body language? What would it, my body language tell them? Every, everything we, we, we tend to look at in a more ordeal, in a more in, inquisitive manner, in which we try to do our best to get that job, don't we? 
We try to be on our best manners, our best behavior. We pressure ourselves into what? Into doing anything to please that person that's going to hire us. We do everything. We prepare and prepare and prepare so that everything that that interviewee wants or the interviewer wants, the interviewee being myself, has to meet, has to give them, has to develop for them, to show them. So therefore, from one aspect, I know what he wants and I want to deliver the best to get that job. Now the same question we can take and put it with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls us and we stand in his hands, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls us, do we prepare ourselves like we prepare ourselves for an interview? Do we go out of our way to look at how we are dressed for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How we smell the scent, how we smell? Or do we just go sweaty, dirty and put the turba down and pray? Because there's a certain level of acceptance towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do you think if you pray in that manner, Allah will accept? We have to do the best that we can. And then Allah takes it from there. Because there's a concept of tawakkul and there's another concept of tawakkul. Two differences. Because someone may come forth and say, well, I leave all my affairs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We know many people that says, I leave everything in the hand of Allah. There's two things here. One of which is that you do what you have to and then leave it with Allah. And the other person, he says, what? I'll leave everything towards Allah. Let's look at the example. Let's look at an example of a farmer. Because the a'mal that we're doing, salat, siyam, it's all like cultivating the hereafter, isn't it? We're planting houses, trees, gardens for the hereafter. One person comes forth, a farmer, and he leaves everything in his farm and he waits. He says, Allah will provide. Allah will give me crops. Allah will give me such and such to grow on my farm. Doesn't do anything. Someone may look at him and say, wow, he, he trusts in Allah. But Allah has given us a brain. There's another farmer that does what? That does everything in his capability. That goes. He makes sure that the fertilizer is ready. The seeds are put in the right manner. That he fertilizes it. That he waters the seed. He does everything that he can to ensure that his garden is growing. Then he says, I leave it in Allah's hands. That's the two different aspects. One person doesn't do anything. The other does everything that he can. Therefore, we want to be one of those people. Not the people that just put the turba down and say, Allahu Akbar. We want to be of the people that dress in a manner that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. Smell in a manner that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves us to smell. Be on time. If you go to a job interview, do you think if you come five, just five minutes late, he puts a note down and says, this person is a latecomer. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls us five times a day. Sorry, three times a day in five prayers. How many times do we come early? When's the last time that we prepared ourselves, had wudu, had our clothes ready and our sujada ready, waiting for the adhan to go? How many times? Job interview, we're there half an hour early. Just to make sure we don't miss the exit or the right entrance and wait at that door. Well, this is just a creation that's going to pay you minimal wage for a job that you're not even going to like. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator of that man, is calling you. What do we do towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And, and I say this to myself before I say it to anyone else. I question myself in this manner before I tell everyone else. Because we're all in this loophole. We're all in this together. We're all in this world to help each other. And in that note, someone may come forth and ask the concentration. Because that's time management. It teaches us. And believe you me, once you have your salah in order, you will never be late for anything else in your life. Make sure your salah it is in order. Make sure you pray on time and see if you're late for anything else. Organization and time management will become something that comes to, as second nature to you. Preparation for anything in your life and organization will become second nature. You won't even have to think about it. 
But look at us nowadays. We have iPhone standard time and Muslim standard time, which is an hour after everything is already started. That's, that's the aspect that we have nowadays. Concentration, which is the second level we want to look at tonight. And we've mentioned most of it in the first dot point, in which we said the concentration goes hand in hand with the preparation of the soul. Hand in hand in what we do to prepare ourselves for the meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As in, do you think you'll have concentration in Salat? If you go to what Salat two or three hours late, you want to have the same concentration as being prepared, having the sajada there, making sure your environment is ready. Because there's one aspect, you can put it down, the turban, not a problem. Allahu Akbar, you start, you finish. You don't remember what rik'ah what rik we're on. We don't know, did we do the tashahud? Didn't we do the tashahud? Are we in the third rik'ah, the fourth rik'ah? We don't know. But there's another aspect which Allah is going to love. Which He says, I want you to be ready for me. You are meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look at us, when we go towards salat, we have to. Because it's wajib. Because it's encompassed. If we don't do it, it becomes a sin. And we're prosecuted, we're punished. So we have to do it. There's people that crave salah time. The ulama, the people that we look up to, they crave it. They become upset when salah is finished. They try to extend their salah as much as they can. And us, we can't remember if we recited it properly or not. We have to repeat a couple of verses. Maybe we did it fast, too fast, or we might have forgotten something to say. And as soon as we finish, alhamdulillah, pack it up quickly, run. We have to aim to be like our ulama. We have to aim to be like our imams, like what our imams want. What more do we want from this life other than to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and please our imams? The person, and this is very interesting, the person has something within himself. And that's why a person is called insan. Because he likes the social beings. You can imagine nowadays, take this into concept. You as one person, imagine you had your dream. Living in the best palace. With the most gold. Everything materialistic under your hands. Everything that you wanted. Now imagine you're in that state of mind. Now imagine on the second level, there's absolutely no other human being to bear witness to that. Absolutely no one else that you can talk to, to tell what you have or show off what you have or to admire what you have. Is it worth anything at all? The things that we have or the palace that we have? It doesn't become worth anything. Now you can imagine to ourselves that when we go towards our grave, there's nothing. There's no one to keep us company. There's no one we can talk to. There's no one that we can complain to. What keeps us company? Our good deeds. And none of our good deeds will be accepted if our salah is not accepted. The Prophet says, he says, if your prayer is accepted, everything else is. If your prayer is not accepted, nothing else is. That's the importance of prayer, brothers and sisters. That's why I chose to talk about prayer in the utmost perspective, as a beginning perspective. Now, concentration, it's all to do with us. If we make the environment ready, if we have particular garments that we wear, a particular scent that's in the sujada when we open it, the turba of Imam Hussein, we will begin to crave it. Make sure we pray in a particular aspect, 30 days in a row, let's try to make it. It becomes second nature. Anything that you do in consistency becomes second nature to you. It's all to do with ourselves. If we train ourselves, we go one step towards Allah, Allah comes ten towards us. And one of the best things and the most illuminating things in our grave is Salatul Layl. Because there's one aspect where we have to pray. As beautiful as it is, we have to pray it. Now there's another aspect in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says it's available. I want you to pray this. These are obligatory. But on the second level, there's something called Salatul Layl. What's Salatul Layl? 
So many bounties you can look at. The Prophet says to Ali ibn Abi Talib, if you want the bounties, khayru dunya, if you want the bounties of this world, you pray Salatul Layl. Of this world, it says you pray Salatul Layl. It says, what about the bounties of the hereafter? It says, if you want khayrul akhirah, you pray Salatul Layl. It's a win-win situation. You are given bounty in this world and the hereafter. Why? Because it's a prayer. Whilst everyone else is asleep, comfortable, you get up to make the Lord that created you pleased. When everyone is snuggled, when everyone is relaxing, you put pressure on yourself to get up and stand in front of your Lord. These prayers might have riya. People might look at us when we pray. Salat al-Subh, Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, Asha. Someone might look at us. We might be in a prideful manner. We might extend our ruku, extend our sujood, make sure we pronounce everything beautifully. But Salat al-Layl, who's watching? Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The narration says the angels, anyone pray Salat al-Layl, the angels look at you on earth like we look at the stars. You look at the stars, how little they are and how much they sparkle in the night. It says the angels look at us like that. And they know the person by their name, their face and characteristics. They know you if you pray Salatul Layl. It's a beautiful thing to start to practice. So on the first level, let's start to perfect our Salat. And then inshallah, Allah will give us the blessing and the tawfiq to go a step further and begin to pray Salatul Layl. Once we pray that, we'll begin to realize the beauty and taste the beauty that Allah has given us. Only then will we taste it. But if we don't do anything because we want to do it, rather we have to do it, there becomes a fine line. Once you want to do ibadah, once you want to go towards Allah, not because you have to, because you crave to be with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you will taste it. Then you will taste what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy will be like. And I end on one particular narration. Because someone may come forth and say, well, I haven't prayed. Someone may come forth and say, my prayer is not perfect. There's a beautiful story of a young man. The person that narrates this is a scholar. He says, I wear a turban. The scholar is saying, he says, I wear a turban. I wear the garments of the ulama. He says, I hopped on a bus. He says, on the bus, I saw and I sat next to a boy that had a tight shirt. His hair was spiked. I didn't think he was very religious. Don't judge a book by its cover. Never say that I am more or greater than this person. Never. You don't know how Allah views him or her, and you don't know how Allah views you. So he says, it became Salah time. And we're on the bus. He says, it became Salah time. Straight away, this boy jumps up. He runs towards the driver. And he says to the driver, you have to stop now. So the alim is saying, he says, I'm the scholar. I thought to myself, let the bus stop. Once it stops, once it stops, then we'll go down and pray. Not a problem. But the boy says, no, you have to stop now. He says, why? He says, I have to pray now. It's Salah time. Allah is calling. I need to pray now. So he looks at the scholar. He says, should I stop? He says, stop. Not a problem. He gets down. The boy prays. The alim comes to him. He says, what's the matter? Why? I've never seen this before. You're not an alim. You're not a man of deen. You're not a man of religiosity at first glance. You're a man that has a tight shirt and spiked hair. You're not a man that people might think is a religious figure. Because that's the problem with our society nowadays. If you dress in a particular manner, or you do something in a particular manner, they automatically dissociate you with society. Like we said, don't judge a book by its cover. The man says to the alim, he says, there's a story behind why I do this. The alim says, tell me the story. So the boy is telling him the story. He says, I am a person that studied medicine. To become a doctor, he says, I studied medicine. He says, I wasn't religious whatsoever. 
I didn't pray. I didn't fast the best of fasts. I didn't know anything. He says, I had a grandmother that was very religious, very religious grandmother. He says, what's the matter? What happened? He says, on the last exam, the last day that I went towards my exam, he says, on the way, there's nothing like stops. There's one tr bus that comes, picks us up from a particular point, takes us towards the university. And it's only one route that you can travel in. And it's very isolated. Okay, not a problem. He says, what happened? He says, on my last exam, the exam that's either I pass and I become a doctor, or I fail and all my courses has gone down the drain. He says, on the way there, the bus tire became flat. A flat tire. So the, pa the person is freaking out. He says to himself, he says, how on earth am I going to get there? There's no time. There's nothing that comes on this road except this bus. No one's going to help us. So he says, in my panic, I'm thinking to Allah, what do I do? What do I do? He says, I remembered that my grandmother told me something. Look at the beauty of this and Salat. He says, my grandmother told me if you are in any doubt or in any trouble whatsoever, any trouble, just say, Ya Sahib al Zaman. And the rain stopped. Sallu ala Muhammad al Muhammad. He says, say, Ya Sahib al Zaman, and he will come to you. He says, I didn't know who Sahib al-Zaman was. Imagine how little this person knew. He says, I didn't know who Sahib al-Zaman was. So what did I say? He says, I said, Ya Sahib zaman Jeddati. I don't know who he is. O oh, time of my grandmother. He says, at that second, I said to myself, if you help me and allow me to go towards my test, I will make sure that every prayer that I pray from now on is on time. He says, I haven't finished the nidr between me and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The bus driver comes around the corner and he says, everyone hop back on. He says, what happened? He says, a man just came, he fixed the tire and he went. He says, where's the man? He says, around the corner. He goes, there's no one there. He says, from that day I knew it was a miracle. And I knew there was an importance for prayers. And from that day till now, he says... That incident, I make sure that my prayers are on time. Look at the importance of prayers, brothers and sisters. Put that into perspective. When we go tomorrow and pray Salat al-Subh, let's prepare for it. Let's ensure that we know that our Imam Sahib al-Asri was zaman is bear witness to that which we pray. And let's pray to Allah on this note and on a final manner that Allah writes us as one of the people that uphold their prayers. That he doesn't allow us to be of those that the Imam says that they take their prayers lightly so that we may receive their intercession on the day of judgment with a surah al mubarakat al fatiha But before three of our loudest salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad.